Great to see everybody here this morning. If you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and be turning with me to the book of James. We're beginning a new series in the book of James today. One of the things that I love to do when I'm beginning a new study on a book or a letter in God's Word is I like to find out three things. Who wrote it, who it's written to, and why? Because when we answer those three questions, really it helps us to put that particular book or that particular letter into its proper context. And so as we begin this study today, that's exactly where I want us to begin. I want us to try and answer those three questions. First of all, number one, who is the author? And you can find your answer in verse one. Notice what it says, this letter is from who, church? This letter is written by James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now some of you are probably thinking, well, dust late. I mean, it's named after him. I mean, I just assumed that he was the writer. But, but what you may not understand and what you may not know is that the James we're looking at or the James we're referring to as the writer of this book would actually be the brother of Jesus, the son of of Mary and Joseph. In fact, if you look at Galatians chapter 1 verse 19, this is what Paul writes, the only other apostle that I met at that time was who church? Was James the Lord's brother. This is, this is Jesus' half-brother. Now some of you may be thinking, well what's so special about that? Or what's so interesting about that? Well, if you look at Scripture, at one point in their lives, Jesus' brothers did not believe in Him. They didn't believe that He was the Messiah. And you can kind of imagine, right? You have the same parents, you grew up in the same home. I'm, you know, I'm supposed to believe that this knucklehead is the Messiah, right? And so you can understand that. But John chapter 7 verse 5 tells us, for even His, referring to Jesus, His own brothers, what? They didn't believe in Him. But after Jesus died and rose from the grave, something happened that changed James' life forever. Remember when Jesus rose from the grave, He appeared to several people, and one of those people was His brother James. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Then He, that's Jesus, was seen by who, church? was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Now, as you can imagine, witnessing, actually seeing the risen Christ would be life-changing. And it was definitely life-changing for James because he went from a non-believer to a believer, but not only a believer. If you look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, we also see that James along with Peter and John, became pillars within the church. In other words, they became leaders within the church. This guy who once didn't believe in Jesus, who didn't believe that he was a Messiah, and so now he becomes a believer in Christ himself. And so this is our writer, John, the Lord's half-brother. Now who is this letter written to? Same verse, James chapter 1, verse 1. He says, I am writing to who, church? I am writing to the 12 tribes who are scattered abroad. Now, when you think of the 12 tribes, who do you think of? Israel, right? You think about the Jews. And so is, here's the question, is James writing to Jews all over the world everywhere? Well, not exactly. Look at verse 2. Notice what he points out. This letter is to the believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, James isn't just writing to Jews. He is writing to Jewish believers. He is writing to, to Jewish Christians. Now, notice something else it says. Who are what? The twelve tribes who are what, church? Who are scattered abroad? Now what in the world does that mean? If you're scattered, right, you're, you're leaving. And we begin to understand what this means as we begin to look at the book of Acts. 
Right? By the time you get into chapter 7 through 9, what you see is this great persecution is rising up against the Jewish Christians. It's rising up against the church. Jewish Christians were being arrested and they were being tortured. And, and some of them were even being killed because of their faith in Jesus. And so this is who, this is who he's writing to. These who are... These people, these Jewish Christians who are being persecuted because of their faith. You know, so oftentimes we think we have it rough, right? We think we, we go through some hard times, and we do. But what I want you to think about are these folks back in the first century. Because you see, if you were a Jew... You were hated by most people in the world. If you were a Christian, you were hated by most Jews. And so if you were a Jewish Christian, then guess what? You were literally a man without a country. In other words, we're looking at some people who were going through some really, really hard times. I mean, they're being taken out of their homes. They're being taken away from their city. They're being taken away from their jobs and, and their family. They're going through these hard times. And James, who is a leader within the church, he, he feels somewhat of a responsibility towards these people spiritually. And so he is writing this letter, which brings us to the why. He is writing this letter to encourage the Jewish Christians to put their faith to work. That's very important. In fact, what I want to encourage you to do is write this down because this is something not only did they need to understand, it's something that we need to understand as Christians today. Faith is not faith at all if it makes no difference in our everyday living. Are you with me? In other words, James here is not calling people to a declaration of faith. What he is calling the people of God to is a demonstration of their faith. And this is especially true during hard times. How we react, how we handle. People are watching to see if we really believe what we say we believe by the way we act. Some of you guys have heard me tell this story probably before. There were these two ladies and they were friends and they hadn't seen each other in a while and they met each other on the street. One of them turns to the other and says, oh man, it's so good to see you. Hadn't seen you in so long. How you doing? And the other lady says, oh man, things are going great. You know, this past summer I took a first aid class and I really enjoyed it. I really learned a lot. And her friend said, well, that's great. Have, have you had an opportunity to put any of that, that training, that, um, you know, first aid course into to effect? And the other lady said, well, I, I actually did just the other day. She said, I came up on this busy intersection where two cars collided with each other and there was glass everywhere and blood and people were screaming. And the other lady said, well, what did you do? And she said, well, she said, I almost panicked. She said, but then I thought back to my training and I put my head between my legs and I didn't pass out. Now I want you to think about this from a spiritual standpoint. Christianity is more than just storing up a bunch of facts. Christianity is more than just saying, I believe in God. Christianity is living out our faith. What we say we believe. In fact, I would say this would be the key verse of this particular book. James chapter 2 verse 14. This is what James writes to them. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say that you have faith, but you don't show it by your what, church? By your actions. In other words, it's not all about what you know. It also has to do with how you live. How you live out what you know. In other words, as far as James is concerned, faith works. And it especially works during those hard times. And, and that's what I want us to talk about is those, 
those hard times that we experience, the trials that come into our life. Look at, look, look at verses 2 through 4 now, James chapter 1. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. Now let's stop right there because there's a couple of things here that James is pointing out about trials that we experience that we really need to grasp and understand. Here's two things. First of all, trials are inevitable. You understand what that means? In other words, what James is saying is trials are going to happen to all of us. Notice he says, when trials come your way. He doesn't say if trials come your way. He says whenever. In other words, when it happens. But you need to understand that it's going to happen. Everybody deals with trials at some point in their life. I heard a story one time about a little six-year-old boy, and man, he was struggling with this whole concept of school. I mean, he, he liked school, but the problem he really struggled with is that you had to go so much. He could not wrap his mind around that. And so one night, as his mom is tucking him into bed, she's trying to encourage him, you know, as far as school is concerned. And finally, the little six-year-old boy turns to his mom and says, Mom, you just don't understand my world. And, and really, that's the temptation, right? The temptation that we fall to many times is poor, pitiful me. No one knows, right? You've, you've heard the song, No one knows the troubles that I've seen. But the truth of the matter is, we've all seen troubles. Right? I mean, how many of you, raise your hand this morning, if you've, had, if you've experienced troubles or trials in your life? Look around, and for those of you who don't have your hand raised, <laughs> guess what? If you live long enough, they're coming. I'm telling you this morning, you won't be the first and you won't be the last. Every one of us experiences hard times and trials in our life. They're inevitable, and James points that out. Number two, he also points out that trials, and y'all may not like this, some of you, trials are indispensable. You see, what James understands is that Satan is going to try and take our trials and our troubles and he's going to try and use that to discourage us and pull us away from God. But James also understand that God wants to take our trials and our troubles and he wants to use those to help us to grow and to become everything that he wants us to be. And so really when it comes to trials, perspective perspective is very, very important. In fact, let me read this letter to you. It was written by a young lady in college. She's writing to her mom and dad. She says, Dear mom and dad, just thought I would drop you a note to clue you in on my plans. <laughs> I have fallen in love with a guy named Jim. He quit high school after the 11th grade to get married. But about a year ago, he got a divorce. We've been going steady for about two months and plan to get married in the fall. Until then, I've decided to move into his apartment. Oh, by the way, Mom, Dad, I think I might be pregnant. At any rate, I've dropped out of school, but I would like to finish college sometime in the future. Then at the very bottom of the letter, it says, P.S. Mom and Dad, I just want you to know that everything I said so far in this letter is not true. But mom and dad, it is true, I got a C in French, and I flunked math, and it is true that I'm going to need some more money for my tuition payments. <laughs> you see, what this young lady understands is perspective, right, makes all the difference in the world. How many of you have ever seen two people who are going through similar circumstances, similar problems in, in their lives, but the outcome is so much different. 
And one of the things that I've learned is the outcome is often determined by the outlook. What's going on here? You know, is, is God working in my life? I mean, let me, let me ask you a question. I just want you to be honest this morning, okay? Uh, you don't have to lie, just be honest. How many of you really, really, really believe God loves you? And how many of you really, really believe that because of his love for you, he wants what is best for you? What James is saying here is I am trusting in the fact that God loves me. And I am trusting in the fact that even though I'm going through these trials and God is allowing these trials to come into my life, God is going to use those things to bring about good in my life. You know, it's very interesting. James uses a specific word here in our text that we many times miss. If you go back and, and you look at the, the text, he, he uses a word, depending on your translation, test or testing of our faith. And if you look at that word in the Greek, it's actually the word dokimos. And you and I, we really can't wrap our minds around that. It doesn't mean that much to us today. But during that time, that word dokimos meant a lot. It comes straight out of the marketplace. You see, one of the things that was huge back in the first century was pottery. I mean, you had to have pottery to cook. You had to have pottery to basically exist. And so you're talking about a really big business. And how they would make pottery, and some of you may have seen this before, is they would take clay and they would mold it and they would shape it into a pot or a bowl or a vase. But then what would they do with that clay after they formed it? They'd put it in the fire, right? And what was the purpose of putting that pot in the fire? It was to make it usable. It was to make that clay harden, to make it strong so that it could be usable. But here's the problem. Sometimes they would use bad clay and they would put that pot or that vase into the fire and when they would pull it out, it would be cracked. It wasn't the fire's fault, right? It was the character of the clay. And, and when they would pull that pot or that vase out of the fire, they would write on it, if it was cracked, ah, which means not, dokimos, which means proven. And, and they couldn't use it. It, it was cracked. But, but if they took a pot or a vase out of the fire and it wasn't cracked, it was solid, it was strong, it was sure, they would write on it, dokimos, proven, tested. And here's what James is saying. The potter doesn't put the vessel into the fire to make it crack. The potter puts the vessel into the fire to make it stronger. And you think about how that relates to our faith. When God allows us to go through hard times and, and, and God allows us to go through trials in our lives, it's, it's for the sole purpose of, of making us stronger and, and molding us into who He wants us to be. Listen to me this morning. The fire's not an option. You realize that, right? I mean, if you were to take that clay as it is and try and use it, it would just continue to collapse and, and to fold up. The fire's not an option. It's got to be put into the fire for it to harden, to become stronger, and to be everything the potter wants it to be. And the same is true with God. We can't reach our full potential for God without being proven. It actually makes us stronger. I don't know how many of you have heard this story before, but there was a young boy who found a cocoon. And he went and he got his dad, and his dad, you know, came out, saw the cocoon. He said, yeah, son, in a few days, that's going to be a butterfly. 
Man, the little boy was real excited and every day he'd go out there and he would watch, you know, for the butterfly to come out. And finally it was that day, the butterfly was coming out and it was starting to struggle, you know, as it's trying to get the cocoon off of its body. Well, the little boy just felt so bad for it. And so he very gently took the cocoon and he opened it up so that the butterfly wouldn't have any struggle. And after an hour or two, the butterfly died. And he couldn't understand it. And so he went and got his dad and he told his dad what had happened. And this is what his dad told him. He said, son, what you need to understand is the struggle to get out of that cocoon was God's way to develop the skeletal structure in the muscle of that butterfly. He said, I know what you were, were thinking. You know, you were just trying to be kind and loving and, and opening that thing up. But he said, what you did by taking away that struggle was you took away his strength. And that butterfly died. Listen, James is not saying that trials are always a good thing. In fact, some of the trials and the, the troubles that we have are created by ourselves, our own choices that we make in this life. And so sometimes trials are a bad thing. But James would say that bad things can produce really good things. If we'll persevere. In fact, let me share with you really three good things that can come from trials, and I'm sure that there are many others, but first of all, um, it purifies our faith. And I think this is very, very important. Look back to verse 3. This time I'm going to read it from a paraphrase because I really like the way this reads. You know that under pressure your faith life is forced into the open and it shows its what, church? Its true colors. Don't we need that at times? How many of you, I know I am, but how many of you would say, there are times when I put my faith in my job, and I put my faith in my health, and I put my faith in this relationship, and I put my faith in money. And then trials come along and it takes those things away from us. And it opens our eyes to what we were really putting our faith in. And that really, all along, what we were putting our faith in was unworthy of the one we should have been putting our faith in. And so it brings us back to who we need to be in our faith. I mean, how many of you have gotten off a track and then something happens and then, man, who do you call out to? Where do you put your faith again? God, please help me out of this. You see it all the time. It purifies our faith. It readjusts our faith back to where we know our faith needs to be. But then also, let me mention this. Um, trials can help grow our patience. Or the word that's used there in some of your translations is perseverance. But you know, so oftentimes when people think about this word patience, they, they think about someone who's passive. Someone who really doesn't care. But in the Bible, patience or perseverance is actually an active steadfastness. It's the courageous refusal to not quit on God and His will. For example, patience or perseverance is when we have health issues. We don't get angry with God and curse God. Instead, we courageously say, I'm hanging with God. Patience or perseverance is, well, it's when people won't let up on us at work. You know, we're having problems with a co-worker, and instead of cursing them, we pray for them. Or, or patience or, or perseverance is when we have a child who continually breaks our heart, but we continue to lift up that child before God and we pray for their salvation. Patience isn't, oh well, can't do anything about it, who cares? Patience is a step of faith that says, I'm hanging in there with God. 
no matter what. And the Bible says until we grow in patience, until we grow in perseverance, guess what? A lot of the other virtues that we're trying to grow in are going to be stunted. Now some of you may be thinking, but Slate, isn't patience a fruit of the Spirit? Well, yeah, it is. But just because we give our lives to Christ, we become a Christian, doesn't mean that we just have all this fruit now hanging off of our spiritual tree, Right? No, it means that we now have the resource of the Holy Spirit so that now we can lean upon Him for strength in those areas where we're weak. You see, before we became a Christian, we lived in the flesh. But when we became a Christian, we're to live in the Spirit. But sometimes we want to go back to the old flesh and we want to try and do this life in our own strength. And when we go through trials, when we have hardships in our lives, it reminds us that we can't do this life in our own strength. It reminds us that we need God's Holy Spirit. And then lastly, it helps us to become more spiritually mature. Look at verse 4. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be, what church? Mature, complete, not lacking anything. Now, sometimes when we think about mature, especially from a spiritual level, we think about growing old in Christ. I've been a Christian for 50 years. But see, here's the problem with that. Some people grow old, but they never grow up. And what I mean by that is some people grow old, but they don't look more and more like Jesus. And, and that's why God wants for us. That's what spiritual growth is all about, is becoming more and more like His Son. Romans 8, 28. We love to use this verse, especially when people are going through hard times, right? And we know that in all things, that's good and bad, God works for the good of those who love Him. Praise God, who have been called according to His purpose. But we leave off verse 29, which is so important. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be confirmed form to what? The likeness of His Son. You see, that's what it's all about. God wants us to grow. He wants us to mature. He wants us to become like His Son, Jesus. In all things. Listen, God doesn't say that every trial is good. What God promises is if we won't quit, we'll persevere. And if we will lean on the Holy Spirit, when we get through that trial, when we get to the other side of that trial, we're going to come out looking more like Jesus. Listen, God knows what He's doing. But do we trust Him? You see, He's always about what's good for us, even when it seems bad even when it really, really hurts at times. But I love what one person posted on Facebook this week. I thought this was priceless. If it makes me more like Jesus, it's worth it. I want to go ahead and offer an invitation this morning.